Okay, we're recording. Okay, so um, so I, I guess we have a session on meta learning today. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about this paper, which is um, the MAML paper, Model Agnostic Meta Learning. And then I'm going to briefly touch on something called Reptile, which is a variant on MAML. It's simpler than MAML. <laughs> Um, and then I think Karan is going to talk about two papers that are uh, variations of this uh, as well. Um, so I thought it would be useful to do this on a whiteboard. Um, so let me see if I can turn my uh, virtual background off. All right. Um, so can you guys... <laughs> Oh, you're Very literally classic. in the office. I thought you switched <laughs> virtual backgrounds to one in the office. That's that's funny. That's such a <laughs> cool trick. You've been in the office all along. That's right. No one guessed. Uh, you should be able to tell from the lighting. Uh, but um, could you? Can you guys read the writing? I I don't know if the video should be mirrored or not. Um, yeah. If we switch to speaker view, we can see it pretty well. And okay. it's not mirrored. We we it's in the right direction. It's in the right direction. Okay. Maybe he yeah, just took a picture and put it as a background. Huh? <laughs> oh, that would be good. <laughs> but it actually has the mammal stuff in it. So, um, yeah, let me let me try this. Hopefully, this will work. Um, and you did the on air sign too, actually. It was yeah, a lot of that. attention to detail. Exactly. Uh, it was really like a deja vu thing. Um, okay. So, I'm going to start here with an overview uh, of mammal. Um, <clears throat> so, the basic. Um, Goal here is to uh, discover um, discover a network that is going to be good at many different tasks. Um, and here, uh, in in terms of notation, tau is going to be the set of tasks that are that we're going to sample from. And you can think of a task as something like um, if you're doing split MNIST, then it's classifying two of the categories at a time. Or in this paper, they have something called split ImageNet, I think, or or uh, mini ImageNet, where you classify. Uh, some subset of the ImageNet categories uh, as as a task, like five of them at a, as a as a task. So, um, and I think this really works well if the tasks are somewhat similar. So, if you look at split ImageNet, they're all kind of image recognition tasks, and they're going to be uh, somewhat similar. Um, and so, we want to discover a network that's going to be good at many different uh, many of these different tasks. And in this particular paper, uh, good means sort of how quickly can you learn each task, right? So uh, if, you're, if you've trained, if you have a network that is going to be trained on, you know, cats versus dogs, how many samples, how many training samples of cats and dogs do you need before it's going to get a reasonable accuracy, right? So in, in, in her case, um, K is how many samples, so, and K is fixed. So let's say you're given five samples of cats and five samples of dogs, how well can you uh, classify cats versus dogs? Okay, so it's a pretty challenging uh, situation. Uh, so the measure of goodness is how quickly you can, you can learn it. And the basic intuition behind it, um, I drew it a di little differently than what she did in the paper. Uh, I think I saw this version somewhere else and it made more sense to me. Um, so imagine this is like your space of weights. Um, so you have a network uh, you know, that has a, uh, you know, a lot of different weights that are possible. And let's look at task one. And this blue line here are all the points in the weight space that are good at doing task one. Okay, so that's going to be some manifold in the, in the weight space. And this red line is all the set of weights that are going to be good at task two. So task one might be cats versus dogs, and this one might be, you know, cars versus trucks or something. And then Task three, this green line, this is all the set points in weight space that are going to be good at task three. And the, the thing is you want it to be very good at all of these tasks with a small number of samples. Now, if you just do normal weight initialization, um, you know, you might end up with your space of parameters, you know, somewhere here. That's, you know, it'll be somewhere near zero when you initialize. And, you know, it's going to take some number of gradient steps to, to be good at uh, task two. It's going to take an even longer number of gradient steps to be good at task three, but you're kind of far away from all of these. But if you've kind of discovered a good network, then you might want to start here. You know, this would be your theta star. And if you could start there, then you could see that with a very small number of gradient steps, you're going to be good at all, all of these different tasks. Okay. 
So that's kind of the goal is can we discover what this theta star is? And you can think of it as a way of initializing the network. Um, and it, but the MAML is a technique for uh, coming up with this. So it's a pretty kind of cool uh, thing. The problem is that this is a huge, uh, very high dimensional uh, search space. So most optimization techniques are not good at searching these uh, you know, uh, uh, high dimensional spaces. And so um, what they did in this paper is basically um, in MAML, uh, these are the different kind of properties of it. Uh, they formulated so you can use gradient descent to find this, uh, uh, find this point. Um, and we know backprop and gradient descent is uh, quite good at, at, seems to be pretty good at solving high dimensional uh, uh, problems. So that's the- A quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in your diagram, if you're, um, if uh, if those are the optimal uh, uh, weights, uh, mm -hmm. if you're deviated from it, are the uh, if you're out in the rest of the space, are they inimical to a good solution, or are they don't cares? In other words, they 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 don't harm, but they don't contribute to a good solution. You you mean these other points here? Yeah. Well, they would just be worse because uh, if you're if let's say you're here. Uh, you would mm -hmm. be good at solving task two, but if you are given task one, it would take you many steps to get there. So, you know, your error, if you're given a fixed number of training samples, like five samples, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be able to uh, achieve good performance there. Okay. So it's not so much of staying on those lines. It's to getting that uh, sweet spot where they uh, are close as possible to each other. Yeah. I mean, if you had an infinite number of training samples, then no matter where you start, um, you know, you'd be able to get to there. And, and that's sort of, you know, typical image net, we don't really care about as much about the initialization. I mean, initialization matters, but uh, because we have so many training samples, uh, and we're going to, you can repeatedly train through them. Um, you know, you, you're okay with having a large number of gradient steps. Yeah. Uh, the, the formulation here is how quickly can you learn it? You know, I was just thinking, I gave you, you know, five images, and you can take five gradient steps, and that's it. Uh, how well can you do? Yeah, I was thinking if they actually were don't cares, then you'd kind of be in a gradientless lake. So that's why I was kind of curious. Uh, well, right. well, yeah, we'll see how we formulate it, but um, you know, the, there is a objective function, and so these these points are worse than this point. Okay. Uh, and this this point is a little better than this point. Okay. Uh, so it's not like it's a flat part of this. Okay. So you always have a clear direction. Okay. Thank you. What? Well, hopefully. <laughs> uh, Another interesting, so uh, they formulated uh, to use gradient descent to solve this problem and backprop. Another interesting thing is that there's no additional parameters introduced by this method. Um, it just uses the, the, the same parameters as, as your network. This is not exactly true. There's a couple of hyperparameters, but basically uh, there's no, no new weights or anything else that's introduced. Um, it can work with any differentiable network. So it just uses leverages backprop on the network itself. And so this is a very general solution um, we could use. Uh, it's applicable to lots of different paradigms like reinforcement learning, classification, regression, and so on. Um, so it's, again, it's a very general purpose thing. The basic way she formulates it here is that um, for uh, the objective function is going to be how well you generalize on a new task after k gradient steps. Okay, so I'll, I'll formulate, uh, formalize that a little bit in a second. And you can think of intuitively what it's doing is it's di discovering a representation, a network structure that is kind of optimal for this set of tasks. So if it's ImageNet, maybe it's discovering image features and things that are gonna be very transferable to other tasks. Um, and that's really what uh, at the end of the day mammal is doing. And so if your tasks are very similar, it's gonna, actually, it's gonna work well. If the tasks are completely different, it may not work well. Okay. Uh, the, so I think it's a very general formalism. The other uh, thing and one of the, the reasons I kind of backed into this is that um, you know, we'll talk about continuous learning and animal and OML a bit next week. Um, and both of those kind of rely on, on meta learning and they formulate the objective function a little bit differently um, to sort of focus on catastrophic forgetting. Um, but 
you know, because it's so general purpose, you can kind of use this for lots of different uh, types of tasks. So I think it's it's a really good kind of tool to have in your in your back pocket. Back pocket. Um, okay. Any, any any questions on the formalism? So yeah, you sense. said the tasks has to be similar. So in a in the split time, there's have to be a six and a nine instead of a, a one and a five. Uh, no, I think those would all be familiar, uh, similar. I mean, um, by similar, I guess I meant it could, it, there should be some, some, something shared across the task that would help. Um, if there isn't something shared at all, then uh, it wouldn't help. So if you, if you're feeding in, um, you know, images as one task and, um, you know, the GSC audio things as another task. Those are like completely different things. And they're, oh, the features you detect would be completely different. But for images, one versus nine or five versus six or whatever, you know, lines are still important. And so those are good features to detect. Um, you know, random network wouldn't have lines in there. So if, you, if your network already discovers lines and curves and stuff like that, it would be quicker at learning uh, the, the new categories. Right? So, I, I mean, this is kind of a rough notion. But the basic idea is there should be some network representation that's shared across all of the different tasks. Yeah. And so that, don't you think it's possible to have a, a representation that's shared across modalities as well? Yeah, I, I, I do think that's possible. <laughs> so it's, but it might, you know, if you make the more different the tasks are, the harder this problem is going to get. And, uh, you know, it may be harder to find, you know, something as good as what I drew on there. But I do think there are a lot of uh, different modalities can share things uh, for sure. Okay, so the algorithm is um, conceptually pretty simple. Um, so F is a network with weights data. Okay, um, so the, basically there's two loops to this uh, thing. There's an outer loop and an inner loop. So the, you start by initializing theta and you can just use uh, you know, whatever initialization you want. And so what you're gonna do in the inner loop is that you're gonna sample a set of tasks. Um, so if you're doing split uh, image net, you might, you know, with two categories at a time, you might do um, you know, uh, pick cat versus dogs, uh, you know, cars versus trucks, tables versus chairs. Those might be a few different tasks that you pick. And then for each task, uh, you're going to train your network, the network that you did start, that you initialized here, on k samples using kind of the standard gradient descent. So you're going to uh, compute the loss uh, on the task from, from your the network, take a gradient step and update the weights, and you get your theta prime i. Okay? So theta, and you're going to do this k times for k samples. And so Theta prime i is the network that was trained on task i. Okay, so you're gonna end up here with a bunch of different networks, one for each task. Okay, so for each one, you start with the initial with theta and you train it and you get somewhere. You start from theta again and you train it and you get somewhere else. You get, end up with a bunch of networks for each of them. So that's your inner loop. And then on the outer loop, what you're gonna do is you're gonna update the the weights of the original model based on a loss function, uh, which is the generalization error for each task. So you take, for each task, you take this theta prime i, um, you get some test samples, uh, you compute the loss on that, and you repeat that for all the tasks you've chosen here. Uh, that gives you kind of the total loss um, on, on each of these tasks. And you take a gradient step against that. Um, and there's a different learning rate here, alpha versus beta for these two steps. Okay. So this is basically uh, going to tell you if you train on k samples, how well did you generalize on that task? And you're going to do that for each of the tasks independently, starting from theta, uh, add it all up, and then take a gradient of that. Okay. Um, and then Basically, you keep doing that. You keep sampling new tasks, uh, updating the weights, and, and then this is your, um, your, your meta loss function, and you update the original uh, network. And then after you've done all of that, hopefully you end up, well, you will end up with some theta star, and hopefully uh, 
it's kind of uh, in this uh, sweet spot. Is that any questions on that? So there's one, uh, one slightly tricky thing here is that this involves computing a second derivative because you're doing gradients on gradients. Um, so in some sense, what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to find a gradient such that a small number of gradients works well. And apparently this is supported by PyTorch and TensorFlow as well. And there's um, code out there, but it is a little slow. Um, uh, she mentions that uh, there's a first order version of this, uh, which seems to work pretty well, which is, um, as it's not really clearly described in the paper, but what I think it's doing is it's just taking the last gradient step for each of these tasks and then just summing those up and then uh, using that to uh, update the weights. So here you're taking K gradient steps for each task. I think she's just looking at the very last gradient step for each of the of the tasks, adding them up and then uh, updating. I think that's what's going on. I'm not. I'm not 100% uh, sure, but this is a uh, this is uh, a lot faster, and apparently this seems to work uh, quite well, as well. It's not quite as good as this this version, but uh, this it works reasonably well. And she mentioned that um, uh, I guess Goodhill was um, uh, it mentioned in some paper that when you're using networks with ReLU, because uh, you know, ReLU is primarily a line, most of the, the second derivatives in most parts of the uh, loss landscape are, are close to zero or, or exactly zero. And so um, second derivative methods, if you're using ReLU, might actually not be, you know, might not add that much uh, additional. Uh, that was kind of the intuition uh, she mentioned. Uh, so this is the only tr uh, real trick here. Uh, to evaluate this network, then what, what they do is um, you start with this F theta star, you sample a new set of tasks. Okay, so there's a held out set of tasks. You, know, you, wanna, you, you don't want to test on the categories that, that you trained on. It's a completely new set of tasks. And then for each of these tasks, you're going to train on K samples uh, and compute the generalization error. So you're going to see, okay, now this new network, how well does it adapt to each new tasks that it hasn't seen during this meta training phase, uh, how well uh, can it generalize given only k samples? Okay. So it's, it's a pretty, um, you know, conceptually, it's a pretty simple uh, formalism. Um, and, uh, you know, again, there's no additional parameters. You use the network itself. Uh, you just have this kind of two, two loops, a loop within a loop. Of course, you got to have a, a reasonable number of tasks uh, to be able to sample from in order to do this. Okay, and then uh, reptile is a very small, uh, a simple variant of that. And the basic thing here is um, you again, I don't know if you can read this. Uh, um, so you're going to sample tasks uh, just like here. Um, uh, you're going to train on each of the uh, tasks again to get this theta i prime. Whoops. To get this theta i prime. So now you have um, a bunch of different networks. And then you just look at the, the difference in the, in the weight uh, values and, and take the average difference in the weights and then just update your original weight. So it's a much simpler version of this. Um, and the beta is another learning rate? Yeah, it's a, it's meant to be the same thing. It's a, it's your meta training learning rate. Um, so here, uh, some of the things are you're not directly using the generalization error. Um, you're using the training. You know, you're using the weights um, that are resulting from using the training set, and then you're just looking at the difference between your starting point and the end point for each of the tasks, and taking the average difference and doing it. So it's much simpler, and um, in the reptile paper anyway, they say that the results are about the same. It uh, works better in some cases and worse in, in some other cases. Um, but you know, certainly it's a much simpler formalism. Okay, I think what I'll do is switch to showing the simulation results uh, uh, from the paper, and then we can go on to Quran. <laughs> 
Okay. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so she applies it uh, to regression and classification and reinforcement learning in any, any network, anything that you can formulate using a deep learning network or a differentiable network can, uh, can, uh, can work here. Um, and what, what I'll do is I'll just show some of the regression and classification samples. So the first simple one that uh, she tries it on is learning these random sine waves. So here the task is, um, let's see, you have a sine wave that's um, dependent on an amplitude parameter and a phase. And these are kind of chosen randomly uh, within this range. So each task is a, you know, a sine wave with a random phase and a random kind of uh, stretching factor. Um, and then um, what you can see here is the left side is mammal with using k equals five or k equals 10 samples um, after training. And um, the red is kind of the ground truth. And this, this finally, the, this sort of heavy dotted line here is what, is the, what the, net, the mammal train network ends up after you train on these five samples. Okay, so you can see it's, it's pretty close to the ground truth and it kind of deviates here, but it's still, even though it's the, the samples were all on this side of the sine wave, this, it still does pretty well here. And this fine green line is, the, um, is what the network outputs uh, before any training is done. So this is after five training samples and then with 10 training samples, uh, it approximates ground truth uh, really well. Uh, the, she compared it with a network that was pre-trained on a whole bunch of these tasks. Um, and there, the, the network does really, really poorly because, you're, because each task is um, with a random phase and a random amplitude, the, the average is going to be basically zero. And so the, the network gets confused between all of these different, it doesn't know what the phase and what the amplitude is. Um, so it just sees a whole bunch of these tasks all as one batch training set. And um, it doesn't really uh, generalize. So what must be going on is the network is learning, you know, it, it really just has to fit two numbers. It has to fit, fit the phase and the amplitude. Um, so just a couple of samples in theory should be enough. So it must be finding some representation such that from a few samples, it can figure out what the phase and the, uh, and the amplitude is. So that's essentially uh, what's going on here. Okay, and this is just a graph showing, you know, as you increase the number of gradient steps, the error with mammal goes down quite fast, whereas the pre-trained one never really uh, gets down. And Oracle is the best that you can do if you, if you knew what theta and what the phase and the uh, amplitude were. And then for classification, um, she tried it on Omniglot, which is that um, data set with I forget, like 1,600 different characters chosen from lots of different uh, alphabets. Uh, so that you have 1,623 or something different categories. And there's five-way accuracy and 20-way accuracy. So five-way accuracy is uh, you're asked to choose from one of different five categories. And you're either given one example as your training uh, set or five examples as your training set. So here the ch chance would be around 20%. And it, um, so MAML uh, you know, get, does better than a bunch of these uh, other techniques on these. Uh, I don't really know what they are. So, <laughs> um, but I think they all have like parameters, other parameters, or they're more complex or, or something like that. Um, I didn't spend time going into this uh, papers, but at least on Omniglot, with MAML with no additional parameters, it does at least as well, if not better than all of these other techniques. Uh, right, those okay. other techniques also have a retraining phase with the, with the, with the images given? I, I think said. so. Yeah, yeah the, I think so. The paradigm is the same for all, all of them. This idea yeah. of comparison. And, and, and Lucas, you may know more about some of these other techniques, but um, apparently they're more complex or have a bunch of other, other parameters that they have to work with. 
yeah, I think the main uh, competitor there would, would be the uh, La Rochelle. Uh, from, uh, I think Caron would know better. He's from, uh, he's gonna, <laughs> he works in Canada, but I don't know if it's Vancouver <laughs> or Toronto. But it, it uses uh, more parameters like learns an LS and learns a function, learn how to use the gradients to update uh, the network. So there is an extra function there and that function has grades. So it, it, it's more complex than memo. And I think that's, they have similar, they have better results, right? So. Uh, which one? Which one are you talking about? Talking about the Meta Learner LS team. Uh, it's from. Uh, oh, oh, this one. Okay, oh, so that's yeah. in the ImageNet. Uh, yeah. Um, is that in? Uh, yeah, she didn't try it here, I guess. And then you have this metrics base that's from Oreo Vinyals. That's it's actually very interesting as well. But it, it's kind of based on the work you guys did. So there's this idea of. Uh, so you have this new task and you want to find uh, how it's closer to the existing tasks you, you were already know, existing classes you already know. So the, uh, for example, one of them is the, the prototypical network. And the idea of the prototypical network is that uh, when you get a new class, you just you divide the space between all these classes you know, and then you, you just look uh, which one is closer and then uh, you, you assign the probability to be of uh, that class. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm making a lot of sense, but we can talk about it. Uh, yeah, it's hard to summarize these in a, in a couple of sentences, probably. Yeah. But I think, um, uh, Karan, are you familiar with uh, Hugo? Hugo's work, do you know him? I think he just mentioned his group saying he was going to be right back. Oh, uh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you can ask him when he gets back. Uh, so let's, let's uh, th this one is the uh, mini image net. Um, task where it's basically a split image net task and uh, you're asked to you, you're the network is asked to distinguish between five different categories so 20 percent is, is chance and you're either given one training example or five training examples um, and uh, MAML here uh, is significantly better than the other uh, techniques um, uh, on this task and with five examples it, it gets to about 63 percent and the first order version um, is very close and actually does a little bit better in the, in the five shot case, uh, which is interesting, uh, but it's probably not significant. They're about the same. Um, what I wished in this comparison that they had was what is the best, it, it's hard for me to tell whether 63% is good or not uh, in, this, in this task. I know for ImageNet, you know, um, you know, so many networks get in the high 70s, low 80% accuracy. Um, and this is on, and that's with a thousand categories. This is a five category task. So I would expect optimal, if you knew, if you were to train on the entire training set would be much higher than 63%. But it would have been nice to have that as a baseline, just to see how close um, it's able to get to that baseline. So right now, I, I, it's really hard for me to tell, okay, is this good or is there a lot of room for improvement? But that, that that's a very few. Uh, the number of images is very uh, just very yeah. few, right? So it's it's very few. So I think as a comparison with these other techniques, that's fine. But it still yeah. would be good to know how far away are we from the absolute optimal that you could do. I mean, a human might do way better than five shot, no, way better than sixty three percent, right? Even with one shot, humans can often learn a category completely. Right. Um, and so, you know, what, what is the best you can do for five-way accuracy if you had, you know, the full training set? Uh, that, that would be just an interesting comparison in my mind. Um, let's see what else. Uh, this was just for completeness. Uh, this was the reptile paper um, uh, you know, from OpenAI. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, you know, they had similar kind of OmniGlot and and mini ImageNet results. In in the case of mini ImageNet, Reptile was a li uh, little bit better than Mammal, um, and in OmniGlot, it was a little bit worse than Mammal, uh, according to them. So, Butai, what's the transduction? I think I missed that. Uh, so. Yeah, it's a weird phrase. As best as I could tell is, so remember in Reptile, uh, the basic way, it does not use the test set at all. 
um, transduction, they include the test set in, in the, as part of the training as well. Uh, MAML uses both the training set and the test set. It, only tra it trains on the training set, but then computes loss on the test set. So um, uh, I think in, in here, um, yeah, the transductive setting where the model classifies the entire test set. And, and, um, and, and maybe that's, it sounds like it's only for, maybe it potentially it only uses that for batch knowledge. Is he saying that in the transduction case, he's sharing between the test samples of different classes? That, that's what he means, what she means there? But that, that, that's my understanding from reading that paragraph, that there is benefits in sharing some information between tests yeah. and if they are in different classes, which is yeah. kind of weird, but I, I see that there is something, something to look at there. Yeah, and then, um, it's just using, yeah, so here, I guess your information is from the batch norm. Um, you know, in MAML, you use, um, it is computing a generalization error uh, using the test set, uh, which Reptile does not, does not use. Um, so, but it, it sounds like even during the meta testing phase, the evaluation phase, they're using the test samples to update the batch norm. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm a little confused about the difference here. Yeah, because just just to go back to to the the training paradigm. So, during the during test, you're gonna show several uh, different classes. Like let's say you're gonna show classes A to E, and then you're gonna ask to predict how well it it does in that in tasks A to E, right? Like you're just gonna yeah. show one image of each one of the tasks and how how well you're doing each one of these tasks. Yeah, and I think what She's saying is that if you share some information between tasks HVE, then you, you can get some improvement. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's what she said. It's also not, I mean, it's not clear, but I'm gonna read it later. Yeah, yeah, it'd be, it'd be uh, good to know. Cause it, it makes this, that uh, pretty much makes, makes up the difference here. <laughs> right. um, you know, without that, the reptile accuracies are lower than mammal. Um, you know, and in Omniglot, it's it's quite a bit lower. So it'd be interesting to understand that a little bit better. So. Okay, that's all I had. Um, these. Um, any other questions? So so Karan, I think you're out for like a few minutes, but. We we're talking about uh, Hugo's uh, La Rochelle work. Are you, do you know him and uh, his work? Um, yeah, I know he does a lot of um, stuff on meta learning. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not too familiar with his work in particular. Uh, uh, but I think I think I actually was here for that part. You, you said he was in like you thought he was in Vancouver or something, right? I, I don't know if he's in, is he in Vancouver or Toronto. No, no he's um, no. Now he's at uh, he's at Google Brain in Montreal. Montreal. Okay, neither then. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry. I was kind confused. Yeah, but I I know for a fact that that um, Ravi and La Rochelle paper is is quite cited. Yeah, I think that that's some really that was some influential work he did in meta learning. Okay, do you want to uh, show your papers? Yeah, uh, I don't know if you hear like some drilling noise in the background, but that's just going on. I can't do anything about it right now. <laughs> I know your pain, Karan. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived across the construction site for like eight months. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So um, the, the couple papers that I'm going to talk about today are um, uh, have to do with looking at MAML through uh, the lens of um, Bayesian statistics. So uh, let's just recap what um, Subutai talked about. So he said, um, you know, in MAML, you have this objective. Um, L of theta, where theta is the meta parameter. Uh, it's the one, it's the pet parameter you learn where you try to, where, from which you can easily step, uh, take a, within a few gradient steps, you can perform a new particular task. And the objective there is just to 
uh, minimize this loss, which is on each individual task, J, um, if the parameter is uh, basically a gradient step um, on that specific loss function for that task from theta, then you want to get, um, you want to do, uh, perform well. That's just a mammal objective. Uh, and so I think um, Subutai on, on the whiteboard, he mentioned, he used um, data star as the task specific parameter for each, um, for each, each task. But I'm going to change up the notation here and use phi or phi. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how it's supposed to be pronounced, uh, phi j. Um, and, and this is the data for uh, each task that we are all the observations that we have um, during learning. So if we think of the loss at each um, for uh, at being a uh, negative log likelihood, then you basically end up with this, which is, um, so all I've done is I've replaced the LJs with minus log probability. So uh, in this case, um, here the parameter is this guy. So theta minus uh, the gradient step from theta. And this whole thing is a loss function here. And that's just the task specific parameter because it's just a gradient step away. So in the maximum likelihood setting, this is what the mammal objective looks like. Okay. So now, um, so we're gonna uh, go from there. And so uh, assume that, um, you know, X, let X just be the data that we, that all the data we have for all, all the tasks. Um, we, can, we can have a likelihood function um, for, the, for the meta parameter. And that's just independently, and that's just independent over all the tasks because um, we're assuming like each task is sort of separate. And this is what the, um, uh, I forget the term for this type of diagram, but this is what the sort of graph looks like. You assume the theta generate, the, you have one theta, the meta parameter, it generates the, all of the task specific parameters. And then that generates the data observa observations that you have. So from here, um, we have this product of individual likelihoods. And what we can do is um, say, is basically say, this is, uh, this is equivalent to integrating over uh, the task specific parameter phi that we've introduced here. So if we just um, integrate over the phi's, we just get this, this likelihood back here. Um, and from that, um, and so now hey, we hey, have Karan? this. Yeah. Yeah, quick question with, the, with this formulation. So, you know, MAML works particularly well when the tasks are share, have some shared characteristics. Uh, and representations. So does this independence assumption kind of, uh, you know, doesn't, you know, obviously it assumes all the tasks are independent, that they're not sharing. Um, I, here though, I think they, they, so actually that's one thing that I wasn't clear about either, why they have this independence assumption, because they do assume um, one meta parameter and that the tasks are all very similar to each other. So there's, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, 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 I guess the individual examples are probably independent, even though there might be shared characteristics within the example. So, yeah. you know, if you think about cats versus dogs, they might share features, but the individual examples of cats and dogs are probably, I guess, independent. But isn't that something just to make the format is easier? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's often the case with Bayesian things, but you want to make sure you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes when you do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in in like one of the later, more later formulations, um, they have uh, they have multiple um, thetas, uh, which I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about soon. And then in that they're not they're not assuming anything about how the tasks are related to each other. Here, here okay. they're still making the same uh, assumption about the tasks being somewhat similar, just like the original mammal paper. Okay, so once we um, write this the individual likelihood for each um, task as this as this uh, integral here, we have a likelihood term and a prior term where the prior is, um, the prior basically influences what, um, what, the meta, what the task specific parameter is given theta. And then here, this is just a likelihood um, for the task uh, given the task specific parameter. And the main assumption here, what they do for, um, for, for a computational, uh, I guess, uh, um, to make it simple, is um, they assume that the, this that this distribution here, the prior on the on the task specific parameter, uh, is a Dirac distribution. So here, um, this Dirac distribution. Okay, well, it's not one. It's um, all the mass of this distribution is um, concentrated at the point, which is just a gradient step from the uh, from the meta parameter. That's where all the mass is concentration, and the distribution is just zero everywhere else. So this is this is equivalent to doing empirical Bayes because in empirical Bayes you're estimating the prior distribution based on the observations that you have, the x's. And here, as you can see, they're 
um, they're, they're determining what the, where the mass of this distribution lies based on the X's. So the X's are actually involved here in computing this prior. And so, so is this uh, saying, so theta or phi J is kind of your, your weight space for the, the best weights for task J, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and this is a generative model that says, you know, from that point, you can, you can generate samples uh, of, of task J. Right. And is that right? Generate samples. Um, well, this is uh, not this, this phi of j is the is the best uh, point in weight space for task j. Um, it's not necessarily well. It's it's the best in the sense that um, you know using this sort of um, this frequentist approach, that's what you uh, obtain as phi j. But I mean, in that yeah. sense, it's the best. Okay. Right. Right. So they're, uh, they're assuming there's like one point in white space, which is the best. Yeah, the exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, and and the and so the real reason they uh, one of the main reasons they do this is just so that um, you know if you if you think of this prior distribution as just being a single as just having uh, all its mass centered at a single point, then um, then basically the this this whole function that you're integrating here just becomes zero except for at one point. So you don't really have to compute the integral. You just this just this just ends up being um, the likelihood at at a certain point, which is the um, which is the estimate that we obtained here. So so um, phi hat is the is, um, is the gradient step from the from the meta parameter. And then and this ultimately becomes um, the likelihood. This ultimately becomes the objective. So um, using what we just obtained on the last slide, if we go back to the maximum likelihood setting. Um, Negative log, the negative log likelihood is just uh, this guy. And um, this thing, which, uh, which is the empirical estimate of the task specific parameter is just, we, just, we can just unroll it as being um, all this. So theta minus the gradient step of the uh, loss on that task. And the nice thing about, so once we get here, this, um, this actually looks very familiar because basically this inner part here is just the, um, in, in MAML, it's just the loss on um, each individual task. And this whole thing here um, is just is just basically the loss on uh, is just the loss for each for each task on mammal. So basically, what what I've just shown you on these last two slides is that um, uh, making the making certain assumptions about the prior distribution over the task specific parameters um, that the maximum likelihood estimation um, of theta given all this given the data x is just the same as the mammal objectives. Are there any questions about this? But MAML doesn't necessarily make these assumptions, right? This is just a one probabilistic interpretation of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so so that's so, so, so right now there's really no there's no real innovation here. It's just we've just reframed MAML as thinking about it in terms of um, in terms of a maximum likelihood estimation, but one of the one of the things that was um, kind of interesting, which I didn't fully understand, is that which which we'll, which we'll talk about is um, r right now to estimate this um, to estimate theta, we're assuming this um, we're we're using a point estimate, right? So we're assuming that this prior distribution here is um, has all its mass concentrated at a single point, and um, and that's 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 what that's what mammal sort of does too, in the sense that it's um, it's taking one gradient step. Or, or a few gradient steps to determine what the task specific parameter should be. Um, but this, well, we can sort of relax that assumption. And, and how they do this is, so we have this likelihood on this prior. So ultimately what we're, what we're doing is we're integrating this posterior prob probability and this posterior is just a posterior over the task specific parameters. Oops. And um, what's happening here is that, um, so originally um, what, what what I showed you earlier is that um, you know since we are using uh, since we are using a point estimate for the prior, uh, what we're essentially doing here is um, instead of integrating this whole posterior function, we're just taking a single point estimate and saying okay this is our approximation to this integral that we want to um, that we want to compute, and that can be that can be sometimes be used that can be useful if your um, posterior function is very peaked around the point um, where you take your point estimate. So if you're 
um, if your posterior function looks sort of like this, I'm not, I, can't, I didn't draw it, but if it looks like this, then that, that's good. But then in the case where it's a really wide posterior function, um, then that's, you're not really getting a good approximation of this integral. Um, mm -hmm. Another technique that they tried, so they're, uh, instead of using the point um, estimate, they, uh, they replaced that with the Laplace approximation, which um, I don't know too much about, but may maybe someone here does. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Laplace approximation, um, what they're doing is they're picking a single, they're, they're taking, they're finding what the mode for this um, posterior function is, I think based on some assumptions. And then they're basically fitting that mode with a, with the, with the Gaussian. And then um, you can integrate that Gaussian. And so you're basically finding the area under this, um, this orange curve here. And that's supposed to be approximate um, this integral, which is the, which is the area under this whole purple curve. So that's still a better approximation than um, taking, that's still a better approximation of the integral here than taking a single point estimate. Where do they get the sigma for the, uh, for the Gaussian for that? So where did they get what? The, uh, the width of the Gaussian, the sigma of the Gaussian. I can see where they get the amplitude, but where they get the width of it. Um, I'm not too sure. So here they, they talked about it a little bit. Okay, well, I can, I can read that section then. You don't have to, I don't want to, okay. Sure, um, so, but I also wanted to show, um, show everyone on this page. So um, if, you, if you look back to, let's go back to the slide, one of these slides here. Yeah, so this whole integral here becomes um, this, just this guy right here. So if you ignore the, the, the pi, it's this integral turns into this, um, just this value right here where you're evaluating the likelihood based on this um, estimate of the task specific parameter. But if you, and that's if you're using the single point estimate, but if you use the Laplace approximation, what happens is that um, you, get more, you get good information about the curvature. Uh, and, and, so this, and so this integral, um, which is just the same one I had on my slide, it tends to have this determinant of this Hessian matrix um, of the posterior distribution. So that's, that, 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 um, that, that now appears in their objective function. So, yeah. And then, so that was, that was all interesting. And then, but then the results didn't look like they provided too much of a boost. So on mini image, image net five-way classification, um, using just a, using just a one-shot um, setting, MAML got 48.7% accuracy. Um, and then they reported uh, using the, the Laplace approximation instead of the point estimation for the task specific parameter, they got about 49.4% accuracy. So it wasn't, uh, so it wasn't a big jump over the uh, original. Right. Uh, good question. I, I don't know how to do the Laplace approximation. Is it uh, more expensive? Is it expensive in some way or not? I don't think so. I think it's, um, I mean, so I don't know too much about Laplace approximations either, and I didn't I didn't really read up read too much into it. But from what I understand, um, it's a way to uh, integrate um, somewhat hard functions to integrate, and that, um, so like I think it's like it's a form. If you have the integral of e to the f of x, then it's it's a way to sort of approximate that integral. But my, my question is: Is there an actual computational cost there of a lemma over a memo? Um, because you're taking approximation. That, I'm not sure about that. All right. Yeah, I, I don't think it should be. Um, it's just uh, the. It's just sort of how you compute the loss function. Right. So the, it shouldn't be too much. Though, right. Okay. Just. Yeah. I mean, the hope might be if you're using the prob probabilistic information, maybe you would converge faster. Um, you know, if, if all the assumptions are valid in your task, this should work um, much better because your assumptions actually match, match the task. But, um, but in, in many cases, it might not. Okay. Um, so that was that. And then um, that was the first of the, that's basically what the first of the two papers um, covered. And then the second one, 
is uh, still looking at uh, mammal through the same lens, but saying, okay, what if we don't make this assumption about um, the tasks being all similar to each other? And if the tasks are heterogeneous, um, what can we do about this? So in this case, instead of having just one meta parameter, theta, now they have um, multiple meta parameters and they all influence how um, the task specific parameter phi is uh, what, what that ends up being. And so, so I sort of, I drew these arrows um, all different colors and different sizes uh, to show that like, you know, they could, they can all have, they can all influence, uh, have little, little or more influence on theta. So in this case, what we do is um, we, they introduce, they introduce this uh, idea of this cluster assignment probability. So um, for task J, the probability that it belongs to um, cluster L. So this, this fancy L right here, it just indexes um, each of the uh, meta parameters. The probability is just proportional to um, the likelihood P of X given theta, which we computed earlier. And this can be, and then that can be evaluated just by um, plugging this into um, this guy here, which, which is, which you evaluate every time you compute the mammal loss anyways. Mm -hmm. So once we have this probability. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty cool. So if this is, uh, if I understand this correctly, it's, it's uh, you're saying there isn't a single, uh, you're not assuming there's a single weight point in weight space, which is you're going to find, but there's multiples L such points and yeah. you're really treating it as a mixture of a bunch of different networks. Each point is a set completely different network. And now you're treating the solution as a, as sort of a, it's an expert system in some sense. It's a mixture of different networks and you're going to figure out hopefully quickly, which net, which cluster or which network you, your data points belong to. But then, then how the update step works? How do you update data? Ah, that's what this whole, um, that's what this whole thing is about. How do, how do we update data? Um, but the, so what you said, um, I guess that's, that's one way to interpret it. Um, I always thought about it more as um, um, having a, a multimodal um, prior distribution. So when I talked about the, mm -hmm. I talked about yeah, the yeah, that would be like a mixture of, yeah, uh, just a mixture. mixture of Gaussians. Yeah. yeah. Like a mixture that's, of, that's how I interpreted it. But I guess, yeah. So each, each network is a point in weight space with a distribution around it. Yeah. Like a, a peak distribution, and now you have a mixture of these, or a, a bunch of clusters. You can call them clusters if you want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, so how do you yeah, learn? Yeah. Then you then you do EM just like a mixture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in this case, um, you just compute these um, assignment probabilities for each individual um, task that it, that the that the task specific parameter was generated from each of the different meta parameters, and then you update this. Um, and when you update this, you're you're updating it just like you do in Mammal, but um, in this gradient, um, you're just weighing uh, the term that comes from, uh, so, so, for, so for each meta parameter, you're just weighing the term that comes from each task based on the assignment probability. And that's, and that's more or less it. So if, 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 one, if, one, um, if one meta parameter was um, supposed to be very responsible for generating one of the task specific parameters, then it takes um, that task specific parameters loss more seriously when, uh, when it's updating. So that's the, that was the idea here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, this could be really powerful. You know, you have to decide what L is, but. Yeah. And then I think um, they didn't talk too much about, in this paper about like at test time, how they're um, going to actually determine what the task specific parameter is. But um, I would assume they just, they just, whatever, whatever assumption you make for the form of the prior distribution over the task specific parameter, you just, um, you just draw it from that mixture distribution. So mm -hmm. fairly straightforward so far. And then, uh, here they had uh, mini image. They tried this out on mini image net five-way classification. So um, this was the original mammal, forty-eight point seven percent. And then as they uh, increased the number of components, they or the number of meta parameters. So components is just the number of meta parameters that they had here. Um, the task, the accuracy, um, sort of shot up. But it was interesting how from three components to four, it went. It went. The accuracy went down. Um, I don't know if that just has to do with the nature of the task that, you know, having three, maybe like the, the task is divided such that the tasks here are divided such that if you have three meta parameters, they sort of capture the data, data generating process better than four would, but um, I wasn't sure. Um, and, and, and in that case, you frame the problem as, as like, um, you could have a different set of, of data for, for different modalities as well. And in this case, we are still in the same domain. You know, if they, we try to use this method to learn uh, tasks in like slightly different domains at least. I mean, let's say it's still computer vision, but let's 
between Im ImageNet and uh, Cypher or something like that. Yeah, or, or MNIST and right. ImageNet would be totally different. Yeah. Do Do you know? I, I, did they mention at all, like in the paper? So you're asking if they tried um, completely separate types of tasks, like ImageNet versus uh, MNIST? Yeah, yeah, not, like not completely different, but like slightly different domains. Yeah, I mean, I imagine this technique would be more powerful there. Exactly. Yeah, it seems like mini ImageNet might not be the optimal, might not be the best way to show this off. But it was still surprising how the the increase in performance wasn't that big, even when they uh, increase the number of components. That was you are still in the same domain, right? So, I mean, the, there is value in, in having like a single set of, of weights because they share a lot of things. But then if you have uh, different domains, then then they see how like having a lot of set, a, a set of uh, weights, which is larger than one, would work better. I don't think they did anything which was too, too different. Um, yeah. Yeah, they might have mentioned it right at the top there. I, th I saw in the art of, you know, uh, in the mammal paper, they had this sine wave example. Um, but here, if you go up a higher, it looks like they had, they did a case where you have very, yeah, right there, you have sine, sine waves, polynomials, and sawtooths. Those are three very different types of shapes. And that's where these three clusters might, could help quite a bit. Oh. So that, that's an artificial scenario, of course, but. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if they had any. Um, so that should work quite a bit better than mammal. Uh, that's just regular mammal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does on the mini image net too. Uh, how significant was it? Uh, not even a little bit. Uh, you, you, yeah, look it, at the stand, you look at the error bars though. Um, yeah, it's one and a half percent, so. Yeah. You know, it's 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 better, but not hugely better. It doesn't show the p value there. My guess is that p value <laughs> but actually it's not relevant, right? Okay. And then um, there's one more thing which I didn't, I wasn't able to get too deep into. So um, they have a scenario here where, so by the way, the EM algorithm which I described in like three lines, it's basically um, given here. And they, they, they have two separate cases, one where you have a finite number where you specify the number of meta parameters. And then what they even have a case where you have an infinite mixture. So you're continually learning new and newer and newer ones. Um, I, I ran out of time, so I didn't, I couldn't get into that, but um, I guess they, they've tried that out on that, that case too. Yeah. But otherwise. It's cool. Okay. And was there anything else? Yeah, so for the for the continual learning case, um, they use Dirichlet process uh, mixtures, which um, again I didn't uh, really get into. So there's a lot of stuff in this paper, I guess, um, that I didn't go too deep into. But um, I think I covered the main the main top the main points. Could you show the the just the top first page of the paper just for completeness? This one. Yeah. Who who's this? Uh... So I know. She was at the um, the machine learning group at Cambridge, so they do a lot of um, Bayesian stuff. So, mm -hmm. fitting that. You said you work with Tom Griffith, right? Is that correct? No, I was in his lab uh, last year. Oh, cool. So you probably saw these papers coming to life. Uh, no, this was definitely done a lot before that. Oh. <laughs> Because this was this paper was at NeurIPS 2019, and so it was it would have already been done um, more than a year ago. Okay. Okay. Cool. So that's nice. That was really good. Yeah, I think the ideas, a lot of the ideas there, um, I really liked. I really liked those. Um, I think the the first paper about just reframing mammal as Bayesian inference. That, that, that I really enjoyed reading that paper when it when 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 I first uh, saw it. Yeah, um, just have to be careful that, um, and it looks like that, uh, you know, that it still works well on complex tasks and, and it does there. Yeah. I still wonder though about the, the, 
computational cost. It's uh, exactly the same. I mean, I d we'd have to go into detail in the derivations and all, but. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the Laplace approximation still? Yeah, not, not just the Laplace approximation, but then when you calculate gamma there, like there are a few extra steps you have to take. Um, I don't know. But for I, those, you don't have to evaluate the whole network, I don't think. Right. Um, it, it, so those it could be pretty quick. But there are a lot of extra small steps. I'm just yeah. want all these extra small steps, how they compound into the uh, full. In, in the mixtures case, um, I could imagine you'd need a lot more training iterations because you, you, you're you doubling, tripling, quadrupling the number of parameters in the, in the network. And that could be, so each 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 iteration is gonna take L times as long as, as normal. And because you have more parameters, you might need more training samples. So it, they may be, uh, two things which are really increasing the runtime of that system. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got through those pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, I think we both kept it very high level. That's probably why. Yeah. Um, and uh, so when we talk about anim animal and OML and stuff, um, they use meta learning as a way to and their objective function is to improve catastrophic forgetting. And so it's an interesting uh, take, take on, on how to do that. So we'll talk about that next week. Okay, anything else? So I have a question, like in, in your first paper, you show that the tasks have to share some similarities. And the second one, the, the probability has to be independent too. So how that, well, together. you know, it, it, you know, it, um, even in mammal, uh, you know, backprop fundamentally, I think, just assumes that each each data point is somewhat independent. Um, there's kind of an IID assumption there. Um, in the mammal formulation, the original I didn't get into this, but um, they they she has a version where you can look at sequences uh, where you don't have independence within a sequence. Um, and I think uh, she might have used that in the reinforcement learning setup, but I didn't really talk about that. But basic backprop for classification and regression assumes IID between the, between the samples. So, uh, Karan, you, you mentioned two papers in this slide? Yeah. What is, what, is, what is the other one? So, the first one was the looking at mammal through this um, Bayesian framework. The, oh. second, the, second, the second one um, was building on the first one, but then just having a, a, a mixture prior. So, you had multiple metaparameters. Okay. Those are two papers. Okay. Yeah. That's two, those are two separate papers. That was a beautiful summary, like 20 minutes, two papers. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but then th I think there's also a lot of things that the papers went into that uh, that I didn't cover. Yeah, but we got the intuitions, which is really nice. Yeah. All right, guys, I guess I can probably stop the recording.